Hey, hello guys. So, thank you so much for inviting me to speak uh, in this conference. And uh, my name is Jayna Ma. Currently, I'm a master's student of the University of Chicago. And the, hey, the name of my paper is uh, Mongolia's Road to Independence, the Power Bargains Between China and Russia. So, generally, generally for our state's independence, people or scholars were focused on diplomatic factors. But in my essay, I argue that the external environment, especially in the favorable external environment, uh, is also important for our country's independence. And uh, in my opinion, the power bargains between China and Russia created a favorable external environment for Mongolia to achieve independence. So uh, in this paper, I am responsible for all research and content writing parts that Dr. Wini was dedicated in the grammar revised parts. So this paper delved into three crucial historical periods that paved the way for Mongolia's independence. So I'll talk about the first two, and the Dr. Willing gonna handle the last one. So the first period spanned from the late 19th century until 1911, and we examined the role of Russia's intervention in the region, and the Qing Empire's policies toward Mongolian people. We'll show how this gradually led to Mongolian's dissatisfaction with the Qing's rule, and how Russia sees the opportunity to prove financial aids and military supports for Mongolia after the Xinhai Revolution over to the Qing Empire. And the second historical period that affected Mongolia's independence began in 1912 and lasted until the late 1920s. During this time, China reasserted its dominance over Mongolia, but the Chinese Civil War disrupted the Chinese government's ability to exert control over uh, the region. We also had the White Russian Army's defeat of Chinese troops in 1919, which led to a small group of Mongolian revolutionaries taking control of Mongolia with Soviet Union's aid. And finally, the third period from 1945 to 1946 was instrumental in Mongolia's independence. The Yalta Conference directly addressed the issue of Mongolia's sovereignty and recognized that China no longer had control over Mongolia. These three periods significantly impacted Mongolia's fight for independence and highlighted the critical role of both domestic and foreign factors in achieving this goal. So initially, I'll talk about some brief background to understand how Mongolia achieved independence. It's crucial to explore the history of civil Mongolian's relation during the Qing Dynasty. So the Qing Dynasty, which was established in 1644, had a close relationship with the Mongolian people even before its formal establishment. Norhach, the first ruler of the Qing Empire, formed an alliance with the Khalkhan Mongolian tribe, which helped him conquer one of the major cities of the Ming Dynasty, Shenyang. The alliance between Manchurians and Mongolians played a significant role in the victory against the Ming Empire. During the 7th century, the Mongolian Empire was split into several presidents that were hostile to each other and the Manchurians saw an opportunity to provoke internal conflicts among them. In 1632, Abahai, Nurhach's descendants, is a Manchurian to initiate various attacks on Mongolians. Most of the Mongolian princedom were conquered by the Manchurians, but conflicts still persisted among the remaining princedom until the Chinese emperor was recognized as a great harm by Mongolians in 1691. After Mongolia was formally annexed under the Qing Empire, the Qing's government granted several privileges to Mongolian nobles to strengthen its domination. This privilege included economic benefits, allowing Chinese princes to marry Mongolian elites, less safeguarding the religious rights of monks in Mongolia. The Qing's empire rule of Mongolia was generally peaceful and stable until the expansion of Russia's empire sphere of influence in East Asia. And from the history, from the first historical periods in 1842, following the defeat of the Qing Empire by the British in the First Opium War, the Qing entered what is known now as the Central Humiliation. During this period, Qing lost a serious war against other great powers, leading to the signing of many unequal treaties that severely weakened the Qing Empire, particularly along its four areas. So, the weakened Qing Empire was challenged by Russia, which sought to expand its sphere of influence in Mongolia. Through a series of unequal treaties with Peking, Russia secured many commercial and economic benefits in Mongolia, including extensive commercial privilege and trading opportunities. 
So by utilizing its economic steady efficiently, Russia was able to extend its influence in Mongolia and develop extensive primary networks with Mongolia and Africa. Plus. Russia further enhanced its relationship with Mongolia, representing gifts to the leading monarch and cultivating him as a friend and ally of Russia. As a result of this close relationship between Mongolian leadership and Russia, the Mongolian government promoted a positive image of Russia and conveyed pro-Russian sentiments to the Mongolian people, eventually leading to the establishment of the regime that was favorable to Russia. And, and also, during simultaneously, the Qing Empire made a significant mistake was its decision to relocate a large number of Han Chinese to Mongolia while simultaneously reducing the privilege and benefits previous granting to the Mongolian nobles. So the policy accelerated the disengagement of Mongolia from China. When the Qing Empire was initially established, the Chinese government made a concerted effort to maintain a stable relationship with the Mongolian elites. However, <coughs> with the onset of the incursion by other countries, Chinese economic growth rapidly deteriorated. As a result, the Chinese government not only reduced many of the economic benefits previously afforded to Mongolia, but also extracted more wealth from the economic benefits previously, sorry, but extracted more wealth from the region. In the late 19th century, apart from general excise taxes, the Chinese government forcefully collected cattle, sheep, and tobacco from Mongolia to improve Peking's financial situation. This placed a um, heavy burden on the Mongolian people. Furthermore, the Chinese government was demanding that the Mongolian ruling class repay the debts owned by China, which forced them to implement stringent economic measure on the Mongolian people. And consequently, this harsh economic, this harsh economic policy resulted in increased animosity and hostilities between Mongolia and China. In order to boost the economy, Chinese government encouraged the Han Chinese to move to Mongolia and cultivate unused land. However, this policy leads to, leads to less, in, less living space for Mongolian and less economic benefits for this growing ones. So the Chinese, the Chinese government also created special, special zones for the Han Chinese that were taxed directly by Beijing. Worse the situations, Mongolians feel that their traditional way of life was being erased and their autonomy and sovereignty were being taken away. So in the early 19th, 19th century, there were many rebellions in China which diverted resources away from Mongolia. Some southern Chinese provinces declared independence from the Qing Empire, causing the Qing to overlook the resentment towards Chinese rule in Mongolia. As a result, Mongolian ruling class began to pursue independence while China continued to weaken. Russia saw an opportunity to gain control over Mongolia by helping rip away from China. The Mongolian ruling class asked for help, and Russia agreed to assist, but in exchange for significant economic interest in this country. After a rebellion led by Jim Stambul and other Mongolian nobles, a professional government was established in November 1911. The Chinese army stationed in Mongolia did not respond to this, and eventually on December 1, 1911, the professional government declared independence. Jim Stambul Bukhan was appointed as the Bukhan, and the new nation was established based on traditional Mongolian values. After the Qing Empire was overthrown in 1912, the Republic of China became the new government. However, despite Mongolians' claim of foreign independence, the new government refused to acknowledge Bukhan's regime as a sovereign nation. The new Chinese president wanted to unify the five major ethnic groups in China, which included Mongolia, as part of the political object. To do this, the Chinese government made several political statements emphasizing sovereignty over the region, and Russia tried to negotiate Mongolia's autonomy, but China refused the proposal and asserted that the Mongolian rule was strictly a domestic matter. The Chinese government granted the Mongolian ruling class more autonomy interest but did not recognize Mongolian sovereignty. Although the Chinese government wanted to reintegrate Mongolia, they also planned to take back by forces if necessary, but due to concern of the potential Russian intervention, they avoided the military actions. At first, Russia did not recognize Mongolia's independence. 
still feels concerned over potential interests of other countries, particularly Japan. Later, Russia signed a secret treaty with the Japan in 1912 that guaranteed their interest in Mongolia. Russia and Mongolia then signed the Russia Mongol Treaty in November of the same year, which granted Russia commercial rights and the rights to intervene in Mongolian politics. And the Chinese government was unhappy with this treaty and accused Russia of violating their sovereignty. But a series of internal conflicts within the Chinese government led Russia to directly contact Ren Shikai, one of China's most powerful leaders, and promised him an consistent exchange for the recognition of Russia, Russia's economic interest in Mongolia and support for Ren's legitimacy as ruler of China. Veshka agreed to the government's offer, and in November 1912, the Chinese government, under his leadership, signed the Sino Russia Statement with Russia. The treaty recognized China's nominal sovereignty over Mongolia while requiring China to respect Mongolia's autonomy, as guaranteed by the 1912 Russia's Mongol Treaty. After signing the treaty, the Chinese government focused more on the internal power struggles. And in 1918, China sent an army led by General Xu Xuan to reclaim Mongolia while Russia was busy with its own civil war. The Mongolian government had to let the Chinese army in as they couldn't resist them alone. In 1919, China held negotiations with Mongolia to cancel its autonomy in Kulun. But the Mongolians want, wanted to keep its autonomy. China threatened them with force, and in November 1919, Mongolia agreed to abandon its autonomy. However, China lost the control of it. Mongolia just one year later, due to a civil war among various warlords in mainland China. The Chinese army had to withdraw, leaving only 300 troops in Kulun. In 1920, a small group of Russian White Army troops and Japanese military advisors entered Mongolia seeking to establish a new regime. From December 1920 to February 1921, the Chinese army and the White Army fought, and the White Army won. Mongolia regains independence under the control of Arjun Stenberg and Bokhan became the nominal top monarch of Mongolia again. So during the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, the Soviet government wanted to expand its sphere of influence into Mongolia again. In 1920, Mongolian Communist Revolutionary led by Shuashan entered Mongolia to subvert urgent Stenberg's regime. However, the White Armies had rapidly expanded to 20,000, making it difficult for the Mongolian revolutionary to defeat them alone. So they request direct assistance from the Soviet government, and in March 1921, the Red Army entered Mongolia to help. The White Army was defeated in July, and the Soviet Union declared that the Red Army would remain in Mongolia until the remaining White Army was eradicated completely. Mongolia was once again under Russia's control. So the Soviet Union sought to establish a friendly relation with China due to concern about potential invasion invasion by Japan, and Mongolia's isolations from the international war order. To convince the Chinese government of their intention, the Soviet government made several public statements about withdrawing their troops from Mongolia after defeating the remaining army. In 1924, both countries signed agreements on settlement of outstanding issue between China and Russia, which emphasized the Chinese sovereignty over Mongolia and assured China that the USSR would remove its troops from Mongolia as soon as possible. However, behind the scenes, the Soviet Union signed an agreement on diplomatic relations with Mongolia, which recognized Shubhasan's regime as the only legitimate government of Mongolia, established a formal diplomatic relation between two states. With China focused on civil war and the Japanese invasion, the Soviet Union gained greater control of influence over Mongolia. And I'll hand over the next part of the Yama Conference to the Dr. Lee. Thank you, Zenyang. Um, I'm Ralph Winnie. I'm the director of the China program at the Eurasia Center, and I do global business development for the Eurasian Business Coalition. Uh, so I'm going to talk about, from 1945 to 46, the Alta Conference and the Republic of China's formal recognition of Mongolia's sovereignty. From the mid-1920s to the end of World War II, China underwent a series of catastrophic wars. So the Chinese government did not have adequate capabilities 
to bargain with the Soviet Union over the Mongolian issue. However, Mongolia was still nominally part of China. Not until 1945, during the Alta Conference, did Mongolia's sovereignty resurface between China and the Soviet Union. In 1945, before the Yalta Conference, World War II was uh, nearing completion. Only two months after the Yalta Conference, uh, both Germany and Italy surrendered. However, Japan still insisted on fighting against the Allies. Based on the estimation of the United States government, U.S. troops still needed to fight an extra 18 months to defeat Japan, even after Nazi Germany surrendered. At least one million uh, American soldiers would die in battle. Therefore, before nuclear weapons were successfully used by the United States, Washington had the urgent need for the Soviet Union to attack Japan as part of the Second Front. Stalin accepted America's request to attack Japan. In exchange, he needed the United States to accept several of his demands. One of the demands of Stalin was to preserve the status quo of Mongolia. In other words, because Mongolia's practical control was already held by the Soviet Union and Mongolia already, what China needed to do was recognize Mongolia's demands. Okay. In Stalin's opinion, Mongolia had geopolitical importance. Once China controlled Mongolia, it could easily cut through the Trans-Siberian Railroads of Russia, which severely threatened the Soviet Union's project capabilities from Europe to Asia. On the other hand, if Mongolia was controlled by the Soviet Union, Russia could rapidly deploy its troops to China's Xinjiang province and, in, and invade the political center of China more efficiently and effectively. Therefore, it was crucial for the United States to maintain a pro-Russia regime in Mongolia. Although the United States worried in, uh, about increasing the Soviet Union's expansion into the region, for the purpose of quickly ending the war, Roosevelt had to accept all of Stalin's demands. Re Since Roosevelt worried that Stalin's demands might discourage China from fighting Japan, he planned not to leak the content of the agreement that was finalized as part of the Alta Conference until Japan surrendered. However, the American ambassador to China, Patrick Hurley, over Roosevelt's objections, decided to inform the Chinese government of the agreement between the Soviet Union and America in advance. The Chinese president at the time was Chiang Kai-shek. He was shocked by the agreement between Stalin and Roosevelt. He realized that if Mongolia was to be recognized as an independent nation, it would lead to a nationalistic backlash that would threaten its power. On the other hand, this issue would also bring about additional obstacles for China to defeat the remaining Japanese troops in the region. Therefore, Chiang Kai-shek sent a message to the Chinese ambassador to America immediately, hoping the ambassador would convince the new American president uh, Harry Truman to withdraw from the agreement. Yet, Harry Truman made it clear that he would not go back from the agreement that was finalized during the Yalta Conference, since the United States still needed the help of the Soviet Union to defeat Japan. Instead, he suggested that the Chinese government immediately hold unilateral negotiations with the Soviet Union in order to bargain for complete control over the Chinese territories. On July 27, 1945, a group of senior Chinese officials went to Moscow to negotiate regarding Stalin's demands in the Alta Conference, and the Mongolian sovereignty issue was the top priority. In, in Chiang Kai-shek's opinion, China could accept Mongolia's autonomy over Mongolia, but this region still needed some nominal control by China. Even though the United States did not interfere in the negotiations, the American ambassador to the Soviet Union messaged the Chinese government that Washington hoped China would immediately accept all the conditions imposed by the Soviet Union since America was facing large pressure against Japan. At the beginning of the negotiations, both China and Russia 
uh, could not come to any kind of compromise agreement about the Mongolian issue. The Chinese government highly emphasized that losing Mongolia was unacceptable for the Chinese on an emotional level. The Soviet Union claimed that maintaining an independent Mongolia was extremely important for the Soviet geopolitical security. Finally, because both um, of American and Soviet demands, Chiang Kai-shek had to abandon his initial stance. Nevertheless, Chiang Kai-shek asked Stalin to compromise on several other issues. After Japan was finally defeated, the Soviet Union needed to recognize the Kuomintang, which was, China, which was uh, Chiang Kai-shek's party, um, so their sovereign and integrity over Manchuria. The Soviet Union could not provide any arms or financial support to the communist party, Chinese Communist Party. Mongolia's independence had to be decided by a referendum of the Mongolian people. Besides this, the stability of Chiang Kai-shek's regime was imperative due to China's engagement with Japan. Stalin promised that he would not raise the Mongolian issue in the public sphere until the war was over. Based on these agreements, China and the Soviet Union signed the Treaty of Friendship and Alliances on August 14, 1945. As a result, on October 20, 1945, more than 90% of the Mongolian people voted for independence in the national referendum. In January 1946, the Chinese government formally recognized Mongolia's independence. After the People's Republic of China was established in 1949, new government formally recognized the treaty's legitimacy. In the end, China, in effect, lost the, bar the bargain of power with Russia over the Mongolian region. In conclusion, uh, this report discussed how Mongolia achieved its independence from China through the perspective of a power bargain between China and Russia. Three important historical periods were analyzed and explored. The late 19th century, by signing different treaties with China, Russia rapidly expanded its sphere of influence over Mongolia. Gradually, the Mongolian ruling class became Russia's ally. On the other hand, the Chinese government mishandled the policy towards Mongolia, which made Mongolia feel that their autonomy was being threatened. As a result, Mongolia was more hostile to the Qing Empire. By 1911, the Xinhai Revolution had broken out. Mongolia began its independence path with the assistance of Russia. From 1912 to the 1920s, China took back Mongolia for a short period of time. However, because of the Chinese Civil War that broke out in 1916, most of the troops that deployed to Mongolia were eventually pulled out, which caused the remaining troops to be defeated by the Russian White Army. Simultaneously, a small number of Mongolian revolutionaries that were supported by the Soviet Union defeated the White Army and established a new political regime. In order to appease China, the Soviet Union still recognized Mongolia as part of China, but secretly established diplomatic relations with Mongolia. Finally, from 1945 to 46, due to the exigent need of the U.S. to ensure the Soviets' help in defeating the Japanese Empire, the American government accepted all of Stalin's demands at the Alta Conference. Maintaining Mongolia's independence was one of Stalin's demands. Under the Soviet and American pressure, Chiang Kai-shek had to make the concessions regarding the Mongolia issue. After the Mongolian re referendum in 1945, the Chinese government formally recognized the independence of Mongolia. We're happy to take any questions we have in the presentation. Okay. Yes, if you could introduce yourself. <coughs> okay. And who are you with? Mongol Oh, okay. Thank you. I've met, we haven't met before. That's why I wanted to. Uh, we have a uh, publication on the 
Uh, it's slowly coming to light. A lot of that was very secretive. And it's not true that the, that joined the wall. Uh, I mean, they kept the large swat of uh, historical model and showed me that in terms of me. So I, I don't know who the model really started. I mean, they lost that much. Well, they really felt that they, they lost that. I, I'm sure it gets you, but I mean, from from uh, historical. Yeah, you can come up there. Yeah, we try to shoot. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. Yeah. so for right now, is, uh, for the segment of the People's Republic, Republic of China, they don't, they don't have a strong view of the using or abandoning of the Mongolians because the problem was descending from the Republic. China. So uh, I don't know about how the current government's position. I think uh, right now the People's Republic of China is remaining neutral because we also build uh, the PRC also build a lot of the uh, cooperations with the uh, Mongolia now. And uh, for Republic of China's uh, that the region in Taiwan, they might feel some uh, losses from that because. Even in their maps, uh, the Mongolia was still a part of China, but not the People's Republic of China. So I believe the government in Taiwan regions may feel some loose because those loss of lands were from them. I mean, yeah, I don't know if this answers your question or. Uh, you know, we have to see what the negotiations were about. Uh, Uh, so you are wondering how Chiang Kai Shen's attitudes in the Yalta Conference? I'm trying to make a point. I don't think you gave up that much. Oh, so of course Chiang Kai Shen feel uh, like very sad and even shame. I mean, for even lose part of Mongolia because in his mind Chiang Kai Shen is a nationalist. So he believed the all continents that uh, even in Qing Empire's territory should belong to the Republic of China. So even, I mean, lose a piece of land of Mongolia, of that half, uh, he feels sad and kind of annoying. That's why he also blamed or those people talk about the issue with the Soviet Union during the Yangon Conference. Yeah, I mean, of course, himself uh, feel very long well, since he's a she was he was a nationalist. Yeah. Any more questions? I think you had a question. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry. Um, my family, independent scholar, sort of following up on uh, this young question. I'm curious, what I'm hearing you say, I'm trying to curious if, if I'm perfect the right way, is of course, Chiang Kai shek very involved in the war. And you're right, I mean, the, the, the largest slot the Mongolia is being taken in the position. Where he worried that as the war ramps up, sort of the neo colonial movement, any loss of territory, whether no matter how big or how small, is potentially a threat in terms of precedence. So I'm just asking if I'm certainly correct in saying that he's in a situation where the loss of any territory is, it, it, it doesn't matter whether it's something he actually personally cares about, it's not how big or how small, he's worried that that means then other uh, power of movement because he, while he is an actualist, he's trying to establish China back to the what it was, he's worried he's. Other great powers are going to start talking about that. Yeah, I would yeah, say no, that's the same. Yes, yes. As powers tried to do you know, many years ago with China. And more questions. Thank you. 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 Presentation about Hangini Romjo, right? And then uh, Hangini Romjo is one of the Hangini Romjo's letters to the United Nations and then to the uh, to the government of uh, United States. It's just before the Mongolia get uh, recognized in the United Nations, uh, Hangini Romjo's letter was, uh, and so it was very clear that uh, we were talking about this like uh, 